play baseball, basketball, and football, ran track, did some stuff, because I just wanted anything to get me out of the house to keep me from worrying about the current environment. The current so that environment. was your escape. Yeah, I, I escaped mentally first because I kept seeing myself in other places, but you don't really know how you're gonna get there. So sports was an outlet, and I was a really good student too as well. So if you got any of the kids, you know, I always believe in, you know, you hit those books because you wanna have, you wanna give yourself every opportunity to go where you're trying to go. And most people won't know where that is, only you. So I just gave myself all those avenues and, um, you know, just really put family first and ran from there. Welcome to another episode of Crockett's Corner, Championship Edition. Now this guy, this guy, I, I, bro, I, I just gotta tell you, this guy is the epitome of what Crockett's Corner is all about. Absolutely. This show is about changing. Yes. This show is about transitioning. Pivoting. Pivoting. Yes. And this guy has had to do it throughout his whole entire career and his life after football. And he just happens to be my dearest friend in the world. Absolutely. So you know what, I don't even know if I can do him justice on this introduction. I'm gonna let you go ahead and handle I mean, that. I mean, that's what you brought me here for. And baby, you already know you are now rocking with the best Roe Parish in the building. So this is what we are about to do. We're about to introduce to you arguably the most awesome undrafted NFL wideout in the history of the game. 14 seasons in the league, eight of those seasons, over a thousand yards. The first undrafted player to go over 10,000 yards when he retired had the most touchdowns ever scored by an undrafted player, most yards ever by an undrafted player. Oh, by the way, three-time Pro Bowler, two-time Super Bowl champion, and uh, he is my frat brother of the greatest fraternity ever invented. I don't know about Kappa all Alpha that. Psi. Let's go ahead and bring him out. Number eight in your program, number one in your heart, Rod Smith yeah. is in the building. My dog. <laughs> What's up, baby? Come on, he, 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 had, he, had to bring, he had to bring in the Kappa Alpha Psi. Look, he, he's a Kappa Alpha Psi. Okay. okay. <laughs> take, take that Kappa off that dog. Hey, hey, it's certain, hey, it's certain hey. stuff we do, y'all y'all just ain't privy to. You know, he's, but, uh, if, oh, if, mm. if, if he had a, you know, that would have been the way he would have went. That's true. I, yeah. I will admit, I will admit, I, I was going to pledge Kappa when I first went to Baylor, but that's another story. But but here today, Rod, man, I, I'm just excited for one. I mean, you know you're my dearest friend in the world. We already know that. But I'm excited for, this is something that you and I have talked about. We've talked about this show and, and this yep. network and this platform mm -hmm. for about a decade, mm -hmm. and it's finally come to fruition. And it just happened to be this weekend in Denver while we're celebrating Super Bowl 32. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you, you, yeah, yeah, I mean, you. yeah, nah, I, do. I didn't yeah. know which one y'all was talking about when you say championship. <laughs> hey, you said championship, I was like, man, I don't know which one, you know. So let, let's just, oh, we're gonna get right into it, Rod. First and foremost, I, that introduction role, outstanding, my brother. I could not have done it any you, better. You gotta read the resume properly. You know for for sure. For, you know. And his resume run, well, is, is deep. And by the way, we're in his crib, so we appreciate you for opening and up the And I was about to say that. Look the, at this know, backdrop. Um, in, in, in the, in didn't the, start off that way. In, in the Smith <laughs> compound, you know. We, in the pivots Smith and compound. the transition and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, and, and you, well, you're getting right into it. You talk about pivot and transition. Let's get right into it. A kid from Texarkana. Tell us a little bit about the young Roderick Dwayne Smith. <laughs> <laughs> you use my government name on national TV? I might have been hiding from some folks, but that's why I shortened it to Rod, bro. I was like, hide. But no, man, you know what, man? It was, it was, um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't change it for the world, man. It was, it was, it was hard, it was rough. Um, you know, the, the mentality I have today came from my roots. It came from Texas County growing up with, you know, single mom, five kids. I'm in the middle. So, you know, I got two older sisters. I got a, a younger sister and a younger brother. And it was just like, it was about the, the five of us, you know, when you were, you were in this position that honestly, you will always be unless somebody decide to get us out. And um, for me, um, you don't know what you don't have because you've never been exposed to anything. Right. And so for me, I started getting exposed through sports. You know, baseball was my first love. It wasn't football. Exactly. So baseball, I played baseball, basketball, and football, ran track, did some stuff, because I just wanted anything to get me out of the house to keep me from worrying about the current environment. The current so that environment. Was your escape. Yeah. I, I escaped mentally first because I kept seeing myself in other places, but you don't really know how you're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. So sports was an outlet, and I was a really good student too as well. So if you got any of the kids, you know, I always believe in, you know, you hit those books. 
because you want to have you want to give yourself every opportunity to go where you're trying to go. And most people won't know where that is, only you. So I just gave myself all those avenues and um, you know, just really put family first and ran from there. So let's let's talk about that. You were a star and when I say row, yeah. who Duke and who? He, he, he can go. Yeah. He, he yeah. can really go. So he he was a true three sports star. And 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 with that being said, you said you don't you never know where that leads you. How did you get to Missouri Southern after Texas County? And and what was that process like? Yeah, you know what? Even that was it was it was one of those things. Like you say, it's a pivot, it's a transition. All of that was so evident to me because in in high school, I played quarterback. You know, I played quarterback my whole life. I did I that's the only position as far as football that I knew. I played backyard football. Well, you know, in backyard in the hood, you play everything. You play everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. You defense linebacker, <laughs> you, you yeah, hoop up tackle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you versus every guy. You ain't got no juice. You're going to get killed. If you can't throw, you're going to get killed. If you can't catch, you're going to get killed. <laughs> so you're going to get killed in, in my neighborhood playing football unless you develop some skills real quick. Right. And so for me, it was quarterback. You know, and in high school, we didn't have a, really a throwing team, but I could throw. Whatever we needed to throw, I could throw. And uh, we had more of a running team uh, back before all the crazy offenses they got right now. And, um, you know, I did well. I did, I, did, I did the best with what I had to work with. Right. You know, not exactly. only just talent-wise for myself, but the system that I was in. Didn't complain about it. I just knew I was going to get to college somehow, some way, because I got to get out of the situation. You know, I can't blame my mom for where we are because I'm grateful for where we are, but I don't want her to be there. I don't want my kids, uh, my, 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 my sisters, my brothers, my, my siblings, I don't want them there. So somebody got to say, hey, listen, I got to get us out of here. So I end up actually getting a football scholarship to Missouri Southern. The crazy part was, bro, I didn't even know what Missouri was. Really? I literally had to pull out a map <laughs> and figure <laughs> out. And then I drew, I had the little compass thing. I was figuring out how far is it from home. Because I was, I was a mama's boy, man. My mom is everything to me. Still to this day, my mom is everything to me. And I'm, exactly. like, I'm like, listen, I don't want to be too far from my mom. But I need to go farther. So was Missouri Southern that choice, or was there a couple other schools? It was, you, had it was, to you know, from? it was it was Louisiana Tech, but all the other schools that ever even talked to me was saying you was gonna play cornerback. Oh, gonna they wanted you to move to DB. And this was in the era when you couldn't be a black quarterback. Right, right. And I said, I'll be damned if I'm not gonna play quarterback in college. That was my my mentality was I'm going to college to play quarterback, and I'm not gonna let anybody um, predict or dictate how where I'm best served right. because of, to me, it was a skin thing. It was a color thing. It wasn't a, it wasn't a knowledge. It wasn't a skill. It wasn't a smarts. But I had all that. But how are you going to know if you automatically saying I'm a corner? You so never you, seen me backpedal. You never seen me tackle and, anybody. Because I never but had done it. that was what they were doing back then. They I was mean, doing that big. Because I played running back, and, and I was a couple of years before you. I played running back. I played quarterback. And they moved me to corner when I got to Baylor. So the same thing. But for you, when you get to Missouri Southern, when did that that – as we call it, that change or that transition happened that yeah. you went from quarterback to becoming an All-American receiver. You, you know what? The, the, the crazy part was my freshman year, I'm there. I'm penciled in to start my freshman year at quarterback. quarterback. Yeah, we run, it, we run the run and shoot. So this back, because remember, at my high school, we was running team. In college, it was run and shoot. That's why I went to that school, so I can show mm -hmm. them that I can throw the football. Got you. And so I'm penciled in to start. We got a game on Saturday. I'm going to start on Wednesday. The head coach quit. I got demoted to the third team Wednesday evening. Wait, wait, wait. The head coach quit before the first game? <laughs> he quit. Him and the athletic director got into a, some argument, whatever. He quit on Wednesday. We had an interim coach come in on and Wednesday. Got demoted on Friday. I got demoted on Wednesday to third team. What the wow. hell? Yeah, bro. So, like you said, all the stuff y'all talk about, that's me. I'm like, but and I hope I really, really hope some of the younger generation pay attention because you think sometimes stuff is set up for failure and it's actually set up for success. And I was right. just yeah. about to say that. Yes. Set me up. Yes. You get moved to corner was a blessing. Yes. Me playing receiver was a blessing, but you don't know it when you're in the moment. So okay, I was in the moment then. Let's go in the yeah, moment. Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the moment. In the moment, I was pissed. I was mad. I was here's the thing. I remember the first game we was playing in Oklahoma. The guy playing quarterback, Alan Brown, still a good friend of mine to this day. Me and Alan still text and talk. Lives over in Arizona. Broke all the school records. Let's just say it like that. It was right. a great choice right. to move him. Both he, he, was a, he, right. was a, he was a JUCO transfer who the new head coach had brought in. Oh. But see, the new head coach didn't bring me in. Right. The one who quit brought me in. So I went, to, I went to the bench, and I'm keeping the clipboard. That first game, 
And, you know, after that game, I said, oh, yeah, I'm about it. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm transferring. I said, there's no way with my talent. And it's just a belief in myself that I'm finna sit on the bench. I said, I'm not about to sit on the bench with this team. I can play somewhere. Right. See, that was, the, that was the first, if y'all call it transition, that was the first pivot. Right, right. right. I'm going to play somewhere if I'm on this team. I'm not finna sit there and do this clipboard every game for 10 games. I'm going to either beat and quit before the season's over and then well, because, y'all gonna find somewhere for me to play. You're gonna find somewhere for so, me to play. So who made something. that decision ultimately where you were gonna play? Was it your decision? Was it the coaches? How did that come about? You know, it was it was a, it's a great question because what it was, it was a conversation. You know, as a young man at the time, I'm 19 years old, and you know, you're making the decision, you don't really, really realize how it's gonna alter your night. But that freshman year when I got demoted, I, I said, Man, listen, um, I can't sit on the bench. I, I believe I have enough talent to play somewhere for this team, because we wasn't a good team, mm-hmm. for one. Mm-hmm. If we're bad and I'm on the bench, I just I just really felt horrible. I said, um, they say, and plus we run around the shoot, so you always got four receivers. Exactly. He said, so can you catch football? I said, yeah, did I play backyard football? Literally, <laughs> literally that's was the, that was my answer. I played backyard football, so catching the football. I yeah, I said, so what was happening is when I got my reps at quarterback, when I didn't get my reps, I go be, I was a backup slot receiver. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm end up catching the ball, making some plays, so I got to get some reps. Because remember, I just got to be on the field. Right. So you end up getting moved permanently to wide receiver, breaking all the all records. This was two years later. Two years, two years later, later, yeah. Two years later, you're breaking all the records and everything. And then there, there, there comes another change, another transition, another pivot. You're getting ready to go pro, have an All-American season, and you tear your ACL. Yeah. How, talk about that, that was, transition. Yeah, that was, um, you know, because from my freshman year, my sophomore year, the guy, Allen, Broke all the school records. My sophomore year, I'm alternating at quarterback and receiver because Allen's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one year, Allen's gone. Matt Cook, who's still a great friend of mine this day, he's a quarterback. I'm a quarterback. And, and I remember I made third team all conference at receiver my sophomore year. My junior year comes, we got a new head coach now. Wow. Coach, coach Lance. So this is yeah. third head coach in three years. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And so, so Coach Lance comes, he said, man, listen. He said, it brought me in his office, and he said, um, listen, we got, we got a little dilemma. He said, you are our starting quarterback. But if Matt starts at quarterback, I'll design a place where you can play receiver. So here's the deal. You can be an all-conference quarterback. You can be an all-American receiver. But my job is to try to get both of y'all on the field at the same time. And me, I said, I like winning. So with that being said, we're going to transition to a break. But we have to talk about it because yeah. you were one of the top All-American wide receivers, getting ready to go pro, and, and your knee happens. And look, people change. You can think what you want to think. You can think you're going where you want to go. But all of a sudden in life, you're going to have to pivot. He had to. We'll pivot. We'll be right back. This is Crocker's Corner. Welcome back to Crocker's Corner Championship Edition. I'm Ray Crockett. My co-host, Ro Pierish. <laughs> Ro P. And this is my man, Rod Smith. Now, Rod, we talked about you getting moved from quarterback to wide receiver. Now you're All-American wide receiver. You're getting ready for the draft. Talk a little bit about your senior year and what transpired in, in doing that time. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it was official my junior year that I was going to play receiver. Uh, made All-American. Actually, in my junior year, I was in the top five of all receivers in the nation. Some people don't know that. Oh, I this, this is this is University of Miami, Nebraska, all of them. And this is the top five. And you were in a, at a Division II school, but still school putting up. And college Hall of Fame. So, yeah. 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 I went to College Hall of Fame before. A whole bunch of dudes that I see going to the College Hall of Fame now, I'm like, damn, I went in before you? Yeah. Like, it's like these right. dudes were big time. They went to bigger schools. Yeah. And I used to always tell myself, I said, at the smaller school, we have just as good a player. We just don't have as many. Exactly. And I wanted to be one of those players that you could go out there and you could say, hey, listen, we, can, we know we can ride this guy. We need to find three, four, five more guys like him. And so my junior year, I made that decision because I wanted to win games. And we, we did. We ended up going to the playoffs and all that stuff. Senior year comes up. Now everybody knows me. You're getting double teams when you walk out the huddle, that type of thing, because they know the ball's going to me in, in, in a lot of situations. Right. And, um, and the, the first, it's the third game. Uh, Matt's hurt. But who's the backup quarterback? Me. Right. I'm about to play quarterback in our third game of the season. I'm the punt returner as well. <laughs> I'm the punt returner as well. Uh, so I'm catching the punt. I'm fair catching the punt, and the dude dove and speared me right in the uh, knee. I never touched the ball. They ejected him or whatever. 
And uh, doctors told me, I never, he said, you'll never play football again. I said, I, and I'm leaving the field, I'm crying, I'm hurt, because for one, I can't play, but then I'm listening to this guy who's this medical professional telling me, you'll never play football again. And I said, I promise you this. I said, you can mark my words on this. I will play again. If I, if I play backyard football or somewhere, but I will play again. I might not play in college, I might not play at the next level, but I will play football again. So you're wrong in, in your evaluation. So when you hear that, all, all your your hopes, your dreams, really just ended at that point about going pro. Because I know after being an All-American your junior year, you're thinking about going pro. You're one of the top receivers in the nation. What, what does your mindset shift to? And at that point, what is the change of your mindset, your attitude, and everything as far as your preparation of, of the draft coming up? See, here's the crazy part. Because it was my senior year and it was the third game, that's why I told you it was the third game. That was pivotal. Because you got an extra year. I end up getting an extra year. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. If I would have played in that game, this is my first time on the field. I never touched the ball. The play didn't count because it was a penalty. Right. So you got the red shirt. So I got a chance. To, they actually have a rule in the NCAA because of me. It was like a, it's, um, it's some kind of hardship rule. Yeah, they had to go through NCAA and all that stuff for me to get, get a chance to come back for another senior year. That's why I went to school for five and a half years. But that's also why I got three degrees in business. And we're going to talk about that. Man, I, took, right, I, took, right, right. I definitely took advantage of that. And so, but that was it, man. Um, and then now I'm coming back my, my second senior year. I got the knee brace. Uh, I'm a little intimidated because, you know, once you had that surgery, it's a, yeah. it, was a, it, was a, it was a major, it was ACL and MCL, both were torn. The same thing that happened to Randall Cunningham. When Randall Cunningham uh -huh. tore See, Randall Cunningham was my idol. He was a black quarterback. And then I didn't tra transition. When I hurt my knee, I still went back to Randall Cunningham. Randall Cunningham had tore his knee up and came back. So I said, I can come back. And that was one of the things. And mentally, I was, it was really hard because I was isolated. I wasn't right. with the team. You're kicking this Cybex machine. You're doing all this work, uh, all these, uh, these uh, you know, the training and all that stuff, the physical mm -hmm. therapy yeah. Yeah. alone. You right. really was alone. Like one of my great friends to this day uh, named Joy, she was a trainer. My, me and her 20 plus years now, she literally knew what I was going through mentally. And she was right there with me and just coaching me through it. You're going to be okay. You're going to be good. You're going to run again. You're going to dominate again. That, that, she was doing that kind mm. of stuff to me while I was going through this because I hated being isolated because right. I'm a team guy. Right. And that, that, that bothered me a lot. And, uh, you know, so my junior year, you know, it wasn't a whole bunch of fanfare. Uh, I ended up with like 800 some yards my junior year. And, of course, you want to get drafted. And I remember laying in, 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 our, in our house. We had a house off campus and. I'm laying there on draft day just praying, you know, for somebody to give me a chance. So fast forward to it, you, you end up not getting drafted. Yeah, that and, sucked. And that, that's what I was about to say. That's heartbreaking. You want to hear your name. Exactly. You want to hear your name called. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. But when that doesn't happen, so now you have to change and pivot to the second part of, okay, free agent. Yeah. How did that happen? How, how did you end up with the Broncos? Dude, it, it, was, it was crazy because, and you'll you, you, you appreciate this one, but um, I'm, I'm laying there. First day of the draft back then, they had two rounds. They had, they had two, three rounds on, and then the rest of them were the second day. So I didn't get drafted the, the first day, but here's the thing. I got a phone call the first day oh. from the Kansas City Chiefs. I got a phone call from the Kansas City Chiefs telling me they're possibly going to take me in the third round. Really? really? Yeah. You didn't know this? I didn't know this. Yeah, dude. The, dude. This is my best friend. Yeah. This is some bull. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was crazy because I got a phone call. I'm, I'm laying on the couch, and I get a call from the Chiefs, and of course, I'm in the house by myself. I made everybody leave, but they want to try to have a draft. Well, I said, dude, I don't even know if this is going to happen. So, right. and that was just me. I just wanted that isolation because I didn't want to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I got a phone. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a call from the Chiefs. And uh, I think the guy's name is Lamond or Lamar or something like that. He called me. Hey, man, we think about taking the third round. It's between you or uh, Chris Penn. I'll never forget it. Chris Penn from Tulsa. This, this, and that, you know. And I, so I'm waiting. And I can, you can see ahead of time who's got. Status coming up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm watching the thing. And uh, I mean, then the guy called me back. He was like, hey, man, uh, yeah, we're just, we're going to go with Chris Penn. We, uh, you know, he went to a bigger school. He's faster than you. He's this, he's this, he's this. And I'm just freaking it's fuming. It's negative. giving you fuel. Oh, yeah. man, he's, I'm fuming though, dude. I mean, literally smoke was probably, yeah. I mean, but you don't know if you're going to get a chance to write that wrong. Right. And, and they drafted Chris Penn in the third round, and I was just crushed. It really, my whole day, but the fact to get the call was cool. And then, of course, the next day, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round. And then my agent called and said, hey, man, uh, you know, the Broncos want to get you as a free agent. 
And I'm like, man, what does that mean? He said, you know, they want to bring you in. You basically want to try out. You get to try out for the Broncos, and, you know, they'll give you $5,000 signing bonus. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, and so that's kind of how it happened. I got a um, call from Wade Phillips that they was going to pick me up, you know, as a free agent and uh, come in there and just, you know, work your tail off, see what you can do. And during this time, this is around the same time, I'm getting a call. I get comes to the Broncos as a free agent. This is the same year. Yeah. So it's my first year with the Broncos, Rod's first year with the Broncos. And, and we don't really know each other at the time no. like that. My first time meeting was at practice. Oh, so so I need to know about this. <laughs> this is one thing I really wanted to ask because two, you two obviously are best friends now. Yeah, right. but you it just thought I was doing it. But because <laughs> typically DBs, wideouts usually don't get along. So talk about that first time you met, and then that first one-on-one -on -one session. You coming in as an undrafted yeah. free agent against the all pro he kicked my ass. <laughs> straight up. Say what was that? No, he kicked my ass straight up. <laughs> but here's here's the thing. You got to remember. I am untrained. Exactly. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a quarterback yeah, right. playing receiver on turf because I knew where the ball was going to go. The ball was going to go to me, so I ran routes how I right. could run routes. And it's open. a major transition from right. college to yeah, pro it's, now. Because uh, everybody's fast. Yeah. And so right. so for me, like you, like you said, so I just knew we had Ray Crockett. I remember the blade Ray Crockett with the samurai sword because <laughs> I saw the poster. No, seriously. Right. That's, that's what I saw. And so... I, I'm not looking at Ray as a defensive back. I'm looking at Ray as an obstacle to me. He wasn't, I didn't know any, hardly anybody. It wasn't about who right. they were. They were basically stopping progress. But I, at the same time, I don't have the tools to combat them. I'm really raw. Extremely my, raw. My, my, right. Yeah, my, my coach, my receiver coach at the time, I ain't going to say his name, he didn't train me. He didn't coach me. He yelled at me for other stuff other people were doing. I literally was the punching bag for everybody. Somebody else screwed up, I got yelled at. Right, yeah. And so... It was really hard to, but because at the time I'm running routes, I slipped and fall every third route because I don't have anything about balance. No one taught me any of that. And he but got what, size 13 and a half feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was, <laughs> yeah. So the biggest feet I ever seen. Like, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That, that's why I don't have to do the toe tap like everybody else, right? <laughs> but so, so, so my thing was is here's the thing. Oh, there's 11 receivers. Wow. I'm number 11. So I'm knowing this is uphill, dude, all the way. The whole thing is uphill. Yeah. I'm just trying to keep these cleats on my feet. I'm, I'm, I'm covering kicks. I'm doing punt return. I'm covering uh, on kickoff team. Now, now, this is stuff that you would have. I ain't never done it in my life. Because you were a star. I ain't never like tackled nobody. Yeah. I ain't never tackled nobody. Yeah. Well, only time I tackled somebody if I threw an interception. I didn't right. throw them an interception, so I had to tackle nobody. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's how Steve Atwater became all pro safety. We talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, talk about, so talk about that, that experience. You going against myself. And I remember oh, yeah. it vividly. That oh, man. It was one of those things where Rod, for whatever reason, you, you kind of feel... When, when somebody, let's just say for me, I didn't want to go against Rod. Right. Because I didn't want to keep beating him. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it. no, for real. I'm, I'm serious. It's real deal. Let me ask you this, Ray. What did you see in, in Rod, even at that point, that maybe gave you a sign, that, okay, this kid might have some promise? Did you see anything? I mean, first, first and foremost, I saw the, the, the no quit attitude. Like, I literally, I mean, no, 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 it's, I was kicking his ass, point <laughs> yeah, blank. Right. Straight up. And, and I didn't want to go against him anymore because I liked him, because I, I, I saw the way he ran, I saw the way he worked, but he kept going against me. He kept wanting I can't to go get better. He wouldn't back down. And that's yeah. what I noticed about him. I noticed that he's one of those guys that he don't mind getting beat as long as he's getting better. Yeah, but I man. wasn't going to be the one to tell him, hey, I can help you get better. He had to humble himself. Yep. And he had to get to that point. And, and talk about that, Rod. Yeah. Talk about that no, transition it, no, it, and it, that that's, change. That's, that's exactly what it was, man. Um, that, that first year, I'm on the practice squad the whole year. Um, and uh, so the, the next year, I, I told myself, I'm making this damn football team. I don't care what I got to do. I'm making this football team. And, of course, he's still there. And and this time I'm a little bit better because I did learn a little bit. Yes, I yeah. didn't get I didn't get better. I that's, didn't get I didn't get a humble opinion. But, but I still but I didn't get much training. It was you literally still self taught. I would say here's one thing I was and I still am to this day is very observant. I watched how he maxed out other dudes, so he couldn't max me out the same way every time. See, every he would beat me this way. He ain't gonna beat me that way again. Cause now I I got a, one little thing I could do against that part, but he had so much stuff that I had never seen. So one day after practice, man, I'm, 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 we in the American Bowl, 
um, which is you know one of the overseas. Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. overseas, and um, one of the other one of the other receivers that this time remember they bring in a whole new crop of receivers every second year. year. Every year, this dude was the American Bowl MVP. They ain't gonna cut the American Bowl MVP, but he don't play special teams. He's jogging on kickoff team. He ain't covering the punts like he supposed to do. Me, I'm hauling butt all day long. I'm working, working, and working. I just need to keep these cleats on my feet. And you know what? They end up cutting dude, and they kept me. So one of the first things I did is I went to him. I said, man, I, I said, look, I got to ask you a question. Because we did it in one-on-ones every day. I said, man, listen, I can beat everybody else. But for some reason, I can't beat you. I need you to help me. Straight up, just like that. I said, I need you to help me. Because yeah. if you don't help me, I, all I saw is I'm going to lose my job. When he says that, what do you say? Oh, I, I, that's all I was waiting on, to be yeah. honest. That's all I was waiting on because at some point, I, I mean, I've, I've mentored a lot of receivers throughout my day, the Herman Moores of the world and all those guys when I was in Detroit. And it was the same when I got here. Anthony Miller, me and Anthony Miller, who's all pro and all that, I was all pro. Who came he in came, as a free agent that same year. Together. So he and I would go against each other all the time. And then I ended up, for whatever reason, going against Rod most of the time. And, and so I started, you know, I, I had that, that little, not say I felt sorry for him, but I had that heart for him. I said, this dude won't quit. You know, I'm like, he ain't backing down. So when he asked me that, it, it really was like a light bulb just went off. Yeah. And, and, it, and it was like, you know what? This is my man. Like, because that was the first time anybody had ever asked me. Normally, coaches would tell me, oh, right, go get right. that guy, Ray. Go get that guy. This is the first time a player had ever said, look, man, I'm humbling myself to I say, need help. I need your help. And, and I told him, I said, three days a week, we in. And, and from that point on, we've been like this. From that point on, and of course, he he went on to break all around. Look, I, I always tell her I have a little pride in that. I said it never comes full circle until the mentee becomes the mentor. Yeah. I'm like, he broke all the records at, at Denver, receiving, passing, all that stuff. He's in the ring of fame. So I, I say I'm a look. And then I play against him in Kansas City, and he beats we'll me all around. We're going to talk, we'll talk, we'll talk about that on the next break. Hey, <laughs> we got the champions here. It is the Crockett's Corner of Champions, the Super Bowl champions, Ray Crockett, Rod Smith, Roe Paris. We'll be right back. Crockett's Corner of Champions, Roe, Rod, Ray. You see the two trophies. I, I, I like that. Like Roe, Rod, smooth. Ray. That was smooth how you did that. I like, like that. that. Yeah, like the triple R. Yeah, I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> so during the break, we were talking about that one time where, you know what I'm saying, you had to put it on, Ray, when you were competing <laughs> against each other. It on, well, Ray, okay, all right. Hey. You, you, you beat him. Break down that story. He was winning the Kansas City well, Chiefs jersey. You know, before we get to that story, let, let's let's go a little bit about the Denver Bronco career because I I, I have to say a little. Your first catch. This is this is the Rod Smith. This is how Rod Smith's career goes. His first catch. He goes into the game. We're losing against Washington Redskins. We need a play to be made, and they bring him in the game, and he gets his first catch. Explain your first catch. Right there. There it is. My, 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 that my guy first, behind that guy? He's in the Hall of Fame. He's in the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> no, my, you know what my first catch, man, was it, it was a all, uh, was no time on the clock. Six seconds on the clock, John threw a Hail Mary. And I jumped up and, and made that play right there. Daryl Green was there. Uh, Richards was there and, and fell into the end zone. Game went touchdown with no time on the clock. You know, I, I tell people no one ever arrived to the NFL greater than me, you no know. Question. And Especially how does that no feel, though? Because you, we just talked about the hardships you went through, yeah. being on, on on developmental, as yeah. they call it, or whatever. They, the whole year. The whole year. Then yep. you finally get in the game. And I'm on special team. And you're on special team. I'm covering kicks. I'm returning punts. I'm, I'm, I'm on kickoff team. I'm getting hit by wedges, these big fat dudes in the line. <laughs> I'm getting busted up by them dudes on the wedges. I'm doing all that. And I remember, um, uh, what's his name? Safety for the Redskins. Stanley uh, Richards. No, 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 not Stanley. It was uh, he played for the Cowboys. Oh, I know you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm from UCLA. I he know knocked. He about. knocked all the receivers out. They are. Everybody was hurt. He knocked all. It was four receivers active in the game, and he knocked all the receivers out. Literally, he knocked out Anthony Miller. He knocked out Mike Pritchard, and he knocked out Ed McCaffrey. There's one safety. So Rod is up now. Knocked out all the people. Yeah. And I have to play. So you next man up. Yeah. yeah. But I remember, I'm, on, I'm only in the game because he knocked out everybody. 
What's, I gotta have his name because it'll make the story that much better. Not James uh, Washington. J James, James Washington. That's, that's, that's who that's exactly who was. James okay, I was thinking James, James Washington. James no, Washington. James, James Washington today, every time I see him, yeah. and I ain't seen Thank him a lot. <laughs> no, your career wouldn't be nothing if it weren't for me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, was, yep. Thank you for knocking everybody out. <laughs> but James Washington literally knocked out all those guys. Really? And it's yeah. the last play of the there game, and I have to go in the game because we ain't got enough guys. Right. We got. Didn't so as you're leaving the huddle, though, John John said something to you. No, he said he said John called 24, 24, 24 double go. Ed McCaffrey is dinged up, but he's out there. I think Red, Ed ran a basic cross. Yeah. And and John dropped back, and I, I just, I'm just running. Right. If you look on the tape, I'm just running. I'm like, he ain't throw it to me. And I'm running. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm the 15 wide receiver. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm running. I look, and I say, oh, oh, dang. So basketball. Ah. Position. If you look at that, it's just all about position. Rebound. Where he at. Yeah, you just go up over, yeah, man. I remember cool. fall. I remember falling in that paint, and I said, and I just stood up like this. Uh, you know, I scored, yeah. and then I just saw the whole team. They hit me. I'm on the bottom of the pile. Yeah. Man, it was it was amazing because remember, I just want to win. Right. And then for me to enter the NFL that way, I just knew after that. I said, yeah, they're gonna give everybody call them on my phone, bro. You made it. I'm telling you, you in there, bro. You in there. Did I'm you have that feeling yourself though? Yeah, I didn't catch another pass for seven weeks. <laughs> <laughs> The first catch was game one, and my second moment. catch, yeah, my second catch came, man, so long. Everybody was like, dude, we thought you would get some games. And no, they all got healthy, and they put them right back in there. And uh, but it was it just the way it was, man. I had six catches my first, my my, my second year in the league, but my first time getting to play. Obviously, you went through a stretch of not catching any balls, but just that catch right there, what did that do for your confidence as a professional wide receiver in the league? You, you know what it was, man. And this is life, man. Life, y'all done said it so many times, you know, pivoting, transitioning, those types of things. You ain't going to have that moment but one time. Are you prepared for the moment? So y'all could have been mad about college. I could have been mad about the pros. I could have been mad about being on the practice squad. I could have been upset and, and, and mad. My coach, my coach was yelling at me about other people's stuff. I could have put all that stuff in my game, and I couldn't worry about any of that. Because I couldn't control any of that stuff. Only I controlled was me. I grew up with nothing, dude. I already won. The fact I got these cleats on, I won. So let me keep them on my feet, but mentally is how I kept them on my feet. You got, I mean, they don't mean the stuff didn't bother me. It's just I learned how to suppress the things that I didn't need. More people today need to learn how to suppress the things you don't need. Hopefully you get enough counseling where you don't even, they don't even come back up anymore. And that's the way I was. So that it gave me some confidence, but still, that's not my goal. My goal is to be the guy in there every snap, not partial snap. So, yeah. so you become that guy. You become the guy that's in there every snap. Yeah. You become all pro and all this stuff. You, you, you become Rod Smith. But we're we getting down to these champs. This is championship weekend, so we're yeah. going to talk about Absolutely. Super Bowl 32. This one. Now, yeah, th this one right here. <laughs> now, now you become Rod Smith. You're a starter. You're, you're a regular starter. starter. You're first year starting. We're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. You have an outstanding year. And, 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 I'm going to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl only because, like you said, your career has been that up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with trials, tribulations. We go to the Super Bowl, and you don't make a catch in yep. the Super Bowl. What does I'm, that I'm, do? I'm the, I'm the leading receiver on the team. On the team. I got. I think I think that year I had 70-some catches for like 1,100-some yards. I think six to seven touchdowns. And the Super Bowl, I had zero catches. But you know what? I always tell everybody, my ring the same size here. <laughs> but I had to, I had to, yeah, this is my thing. About that my mindset. role in that game was to block. My role in that game was clear, clear it out sometimes. Cause they're gonna, they're gonna, remember, they're not finna let me get off on in this game. So they're gonna have some combination coverage and stuff like that. So my role was, if my role is to be a decoy, I'm the best decoy in the game. But if my role was to block the safety, Leroy Butler just went into the Hall of Fame. So instead, when he walked out, what North, most teams would do, they would let the, the either uh, the, the, the running back would have to block him. Rod, you block him. Hey, uh, the linebacker walks out on you, you block him like he's a corner or a safety. And so that was my job. TD ended up being a Super Bowl MVP. But so that was my role. I, it, it, it didn't dawn on me till the game was completely over that I never even caught a pass. Right. It didn't and, dawn and on me. And a lot of us see. Yeah, see, it's all about teams. It's all about That winning. is the, the equivalent of of life and business because in business your role changes yeah. and some people can handle not being this guy or not being that guy and they get pissed off and they pout and they do all this stuff and all of a sudden I never noticed he didn't get I'm his best friend mm -hmm. I never noticed he didn't catch a pass that game until after the game because yeah. he he 
kept a smile on his face. He kept working hard. Celebrating like can, everybody you, else. You can never tell. So with that being said, Rod, with that feeling, when the game is over, at that point, do you sit back and say, damn, I didn't catch a ball. You know, it, it, it never really dawned on me because this was what it was about. It wasn't about Rod, it was about us. It was about all these, you know, the different guys you see on the wall and some of the guys who ain't gave me their jersey yet, they have put <laughs> on the wall. Some of those guys like <laughs> Ray Crockett. I wasn't going to say his name. I was going to say it for you. <laughs> but no, no, but uh, it's just, uh, but it's, it's just one of those things where, man, if you're really about team and you're really about winning, then be about that. That's me. Like, I just, like I say, I just knew, remember, Denver had never won a championship. The reason we're here today is all the fellas are back. It's been 25 years since we won that championship. The first championship ever for this city, we won three now. We've got two of them, and it's just, but if you're really about team and you're really about winning, then be about it, and that's me. I know if at the end of the day, you know, I wasn't looking to try to be MVP. I, wasn't, I was just looking for us to win, because here's one thing I know they can't do. They can't never take it away. Never take it away. And, and you, we end up winning the Super Bowl, and, and then let's go to the individual part of it. Like you said, I think that is part of the reason why you got your first big deal was yeah. because of the way you reacted during that Super Bowl, not catching a ball. You get your first big deal. What does that feel I'm, like? I'm, I'm the lowest paid starter in the NFL. Exactly, at this time. Yeah, I'm the lowest paid starter. Lowest paid starter, but leading receiver for the team. I'm leading yeah. the conference. I'm leading pretty much most. I'm probably in the top seven, eight receivers in the league. But I'm, and I'm making $400,000. Everybody else making... The Joey Galloways of the world. These guys went to Ohio State. They made all that money. I mean, nothing against Joey. I mean, he's a great receiver, but, and they recognize that. And I'm, I'm just like, so now it's a matter of do we renegotiate the contract or what do we do, you know? And I remember um, having, having this conversation uh, with them. They offered me a deal. It was like, it was, honestly, it was terrible. They offered me a deal. I'm like, listen, I'm not desperate. Way below market value. Way below Way market below. value. It, you know, it has some millions of dollars in it. And most people would just jump on that. And I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, for that, I said, what am I getting in the next two years? Yeah, said, you waited business. this long. Yeah. It's business for me, right? I said, what am I getting in the next year? Yeah, remember, this is my year three. This, I practiced while I was one year. That I played at, uh, a special team the second year. This is my first year starting. I'm in year four. But I'm not making year four minimum. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at my contract. Like, in two years, I'm going to make 1.7. I'll make 700000 this year, a million next year. And then they come with a deal like four years, like five years, $7 million or something like that. I'm like, no. I told my agent, I said, no, I'm good. I'll just make my seven. I'll make my million and I'll go somewhere else. Right. Because I'm not, I mean, I'm loyal to the business of Rod Smith. Rod Smith is a business himself. I love the Broncos, but I'm not going to devalue myself for the Broncos. And so. Um, so they came they, around. They, they came back around. Yeah. And I remember we was, in, we was actually in camp. Yeah. Because I had, you know, because you know, big guys holding out and all that stuff. Hey, man, you get a new contract? I'm like, dude, I ain't worried about a contract. I'm under contract. That's what I told him. My agent was working on some stuff, and then they come back with a contract that added like $20 million to it. They took a year off and added 20 I said, where did they get this extra? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, it you want literally, a player, you can find money. Right? Yeah, no, they added like $12 million. So it went, to, it went from a, like a six-year, like $7 million contract to like a seven-year, $19 million contract but with, you know, some bonus up front and all that stuff. Right. So in those two years, I was making like over $3 million versus uh, 700000 right. So you see what I'm saying? So, so, so now yeah. you become, you are yeah. in the league, you've made it. Talk about that change, and not, not just for you, that change and transition for you and your family. Yeah, yeah. Because was, now this, <laughs> this is a, a mama we made it moment. No, you know, it's two, it's two moments like that. The, the first one happened, I was in camp. This is when I first got the semi-big deal. And this is, now we don't want a second Super Bowl. Right. So during that time, we in camp, and I remember Aaron Schefter comes to me. And let's talk about the second Super Bowl right quick. He caught some passes in that game. Yeah, I caught a lot of them. <laughs> All right. So, so, so here's what happened. So I'm, I'm, I, I didn't, we didn't re renegotiated my contract. And I didn't tell anybody. I just, and I'm going to, we in camp in Greeley, and I'm going to lunch. And Adam Schefter said, hey, man, uh, yeah, I know about the contract. I've talked to some people, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking no one knows, but Adam Schefter knows. And um, he says, so, so now that you got this new money, what are you going to do? I said, well, you know what I'm going to do, man? Go uh, with this wiper blades for my truck, and I'm going to get me a chicken sandwich for winning. And he was like, what? Dude, you just got millions of dollars. I said, I said that's, is, the, the money is because of my value. That's not going to change who I am as a person. 
But when I got the second contract, this is when I get the bigger contract. Right. After the second Super Bowl, now I'm all pro, and now, you know, we didn't want two Super Bowls. I remember we was negotiating the contract, and uh, they had offered like $10 million on signing bonus. And I was like, no. I'm looking at Joy Galloway, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, he was the first round, uh, Keyshawn Johnson. Remember, they're in my conference, and I'm looking at their contracts. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, these guys are making way more money than me, and they don't have no, they ain't got no hardware, nothing against them. They ain't have more catches, yards, or touchdowns right. over a four year span. Yeah. And why am I making less money than them? Because you want to evaluate it, right? And uh, they offered 10 million. Now I told my agent, I said, no, nah. I said, I'm good. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to take it. So they end up redoing it, move some money to the front, contract is done. I'm visiting my mom. All of a sudden, they FedEx the contract to my mama's house. Doorbell rings, I go to the door, I see the FedEx guy. I'm like, hold up, bro, stay right there. He's like, what? I said, stay right there, don't move. And uh, I grabbed the contract, I looked at it, I got $11 million signing bonus. Right. I, signed, I signed the contract, I put it back in the thing. <laughs> dude standing there, dude standing there like, I said, hold on, man. I said, look at man, make sure you get your ass back to Denver to make sure that they get this place. <laughs> he don't know who I am, he don't know nothing. He has no clue. So my mom comes out. Soon as the dude leaves, I close the door. My mom comes out, who's that at the door? Uh, uh yeah, it was the Bronco. They sent me my contract. She's like, what? So I said, I said, I said, what you want? She's like, what do you mean we good? I said, what do you want? What do you mean we good? What did you, what did you get? I said, I can't tell you that, but what do you want? Uh -huh. And I said, I saw it was Lev Main. I said, what? I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, we good. I said, we good. And, and, and with that being said, <laughs> look, look, we're we going to we gonna transition to a break. We got to pay the bills. Because yeah. I know you're Lev Main. You ain't paying the bills. No, 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 no. So we're going to pay the bills. We'll be back. But we're going to talk about this new change and new transition, not just for him, but for the family. Because, you know, with more money, more problems. Yes. We'll be back. This is Crockett's Corner. Crockett's corner of champions, the man that kept the cleats on his feet, always selfless, always ready to catch that deep ball and go up against the highest point. Rod Smith along with Ray Crockett, this is what we're doing. Eleven million dollars. Eleven million dollars. <laughs> my, my, my money, man. I'm just saying. You said it. That just was a long time ago. That money got. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you receive that FedEx envelope, you sign it, you send it back, you say, "Mama, we good." What does that feel like for you personally? What, 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 what is the feeling? The money to me was a. Uh, a 12 year old kid speaking his life into existence. And now here I am, I got two Super Bowl rings and all I focus on is making sure I can provide financially for the things that I want need for not just my family, but then of course now comes my kids and then grandkids. So it's a, it's a whole big old deal. And when you become you Inc, man, it's, it takes a lot of- uh, I like that, yeah, I like that, yeah. that. Let's talk about Let's talk that about transition, that because, yeah. Because not only, so you signed this contract, you get yeah. the money, but you were already prepared because- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being three, a, degrees. Be, three degrees. Three yeah. degrees, yeah, all in there. business. Yes, absolutely. So you, so you were very well prepared to manage this situation. But here's the thing, you're not. Why so? Most of the people who taught me the degree didn't make the money I was making. Didn't have money. Just because you can teach something don't mean you actually, actually own it. Most of the people who actually teach in college don't have the business. They don't have a business. They have a degree to teach business. Those who can't do, do teach. And, and it's kind of no. like me and Rod talk about it all the time. All the time. You can't teach me how to be a millionaire. If you if haven't been a millionaire. millionaire. Right. You like, can go through, you can give me some, some, some st statistics. You can give me some study. You can give me some case study, stuff like that. But for me... I, I got these three degrees in business, but no one ever taught you how to handle your millions. They only teach you how to handle other people's millions. Because remember, school is designed for me to teach to work for somebody else. It's not right. designed for me to be an entrepreneur. It's not designed for me to be, it's not designed for me to definitely have a $40 million contract. Exactly. So, no one so talked you, about that. Now you get this $40 million contract. Talk about the, the, the mindset the change and the transition, because now it's not just you. Yeah. Now you have to transition your whole family. Not just your kids, not just your sisters, your, your, you know, your siblings, but now it's everybody. Yeah. Rob, like you said, Rod Smith is you, Inc., and yeah. everybody else has to learn from Rod. How do you go about that? Yeah, because when, when and guys, we see it all the time, when, when, when a person in a family comes up with money, everybody feels they made the money. Everybody wants to spend the money. One thing I can say about my family, they never got like that. Because I started with nothing, so they always was used to me not having nothing. They know I'm in there and I'm grinding, I'm working, and they support me. And I'm always, of course, I bought my sister's cars and my brother's stuff. You know, all of them live in houses that I've paid for. 
But I did all that stuff strategically. See, I'm I'm reading Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He gave me a book. I'll tell you how it really changed my life. We're on our way to New York. I'll never forget it. He said, bro, you need to read this book. My seat was behind his seat. And this is why it just, it was just solidifying our relationship yeah. because it went from the football field, it went to my mindset. And yeah, then it we went both to just money. Having to have degrees in business as it, well. It went to yeah. money because he had money. I didn't say this in the first couple segments. I didn't like his ass. <laughs> why, me, did you, why did you not like me, him? No, no, no. He didn't know I didn't like him because you know what yeah, it was? I would have never helped his ass. <laughs> no, but here, you know, here's, here's what I didn't like. I was jealous of the fact that how Ray got to live and I didn't get to live that way. Lifestyle. His lifestyle yeah. was he's flashy. I'm not flashy. Right. Ray had nice cars. He got every car in the book and he got money. Remember, I'm on the practice squad. I'm on the second year. I'm making, I made 66, I think 67,000 my first year. I made 102 or something like that my second year. He making that per week. But it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't jealous of him, but it's just that like, and I saw he was loud. He's still loud. Right, but and, and and I was quiet and reserved. Right, but at the same time, I, I admired him more than was jealous of him. Life doesn't, to me anyway. Relationships in life doesn't go full circle until the mentee becomes a mentor, and and that has happened in our relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It has happened because he and I. I used to bring my Ferraris and all, and let Rod drive and say, "Hey, Rod, look, get used to this because you're gonna have it." Yeah, I was scared of driving things. He, he didn't want to drive another car. I'm like, but one reason I was scared to drive them. Because if I wrecked them, I could afford them. No, I could. I could. Oh, could? Okay. Yeah, but at that time, I could afford it. Right. But I was still scared of that 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 next level. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't want to drive it because if I wreck it, I can buy it. I, can buy it. Right. I don't want to buy it. Don't but my, my, and so he gave me the book. Let me go back to the book. He gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I'm reading this book. Robert Kiyosaki to this day is in my phone. He's my mentor to this day. Yeah. Uh, over 20 years, this man been in my life. But it started because of him. I'm reading this book. I didn't hit 100 pages before we landed. I had never read a book that from cover to 100 pages that fast in my life because I was engulfed in the story and I realized that I need to make some changes in my life financially because I was making this good money, but literally I have a co program I teach right now called thenumberschallenge.com, right? It's the Numbers Challenge. And the reason I teach it, it came from one sheet of paper from 20 some years ago because of a book he gave me. So let's let's talk about that too, Rob, because you you mastered that. You mastered, you know, like I said, you ended up in the ring of fame, got all the records of the Broncos. Everybody can look that up. But let's let's talk about the part that they can't look up. This is the trials and tribulations that you still have to face, even when you're yeah. off the field. Not only did you help me through a tough, tough, tough time yeah. doing doing off the field, but then it comes to you. You have everything mastered. You and I, we're empty nesters. We're talking about traveling, we're talking about all this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah, Our beloved uh, Vanessa, yeah. she passes away from sickle cell, and I, and I know that's tough for you. And, and she has two young boys, so you go from being an empty nester now to basically being a father again. How, oh boy! How do you handle that? I mean, I know I, I tried to help you as a friend, but how no, do you all you guys, that? all you all you guys were there. Um, that's why team is so important, but. Most people don't think about team for their life. They only think about team for the sport or whatever, you know. And so, um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But because uh, she was, uh, you know, she did everything as as well as she could, you know, to to raise those boys. And uh, you know, they live with me. They live with me forever. And uh, because because of her sickness, she couldn't work full time. She couldn't right. You know, someone said, no, babe, you need to stay. I know you want to be independent, but I like, money-wise, I can pay for you to live somewhere, but if you get sick, who's there? But she had Rod Smith in her, though. Yeah. Nice. So she's independent. Right. She, ain't, she ain't trying to listen. But uh, at the same time, so she ended up moving back to Missouri because her mom is in Missouri, and she wanted her mom to be a part of the boy's life because the boys are now, at this time, they six and eight. You know what I'm saying? They six and eight years old. They moved back to Missouri, but I said, you need to be close to the hospitals and all that stuff. And so just, you know, long story short, man, and um, I remember our last conversation, and she's always said, Dad, if something happens to me, you make sure you take the boys. Dad, if yeah, something happens to me, man. Always she no always words. say, be quiet, quit saying it, don't speak that into existence. Right, right. Because and the reason I say that, because all this stuff you see, I spoke it into existence. Words see, when I ain't had no, what, your words are, are, are amazing. When I didn't have anything, I was touring his house. Most of the stuff you see in this house, it came from his house. When I ain't had nothing, he invited me to his house, and I got the dream building in his house. And so 
you know, when all the stuff happened in Missouri, man, just um, I said I got to honor that. So do you have, Rod, something to tell the world? Because we know, like I said, this platform and, and for you and I and for Roe as well, we want to teach. We want to help somebody if we can help someone. And I've, and I've seen it in you over these last years. What would you say to someone who, who's going through an all of a sudden pivot? Because the one thing we always talk about is that something that's inevitable and that's change. Yeah. What do you say to, to the people out there who are going through tough times, having to pivot, having to change, and having to transition? See, one of the things about pivot and change, see, the better you handle it, the better you can teach it. See, all the pivots and changes I went through, I shared it with my grandkids. I shared it with my mom. I shared it with my, with my friends. Because they're going to go through something. They ain't going to know how to handle it. But if you handle yours correctly, you can share it with them. So your, sometimes the trial and tribulation ain't for you. That's what most people don't realize. Mm -hmm. It's for you to adopt it so you can actually help somebody else when they're going through it. You know what I'm saying? The mental part, the, the, the sorrow, the hurt, it ain't never going away. Every day, I mean, every single day. I mean, I literally cry every day, but uh, but I smile every day, amen to that. every single day. Amen, amen to that. And, and, and normally this is the time where at Crocker's Corner we would do our normal toast. My man doesn't drink. No, no. no. <laughs> he doesn't drink, but I, I would definitely toast a glass of water with him on this one. <laughs> and, and, and something he just said there is, in life, you guys, Everybody wants it to be easy. Everybody wants it to be good. And life is never that. The, the better you learn how to handle chaos is the better you will become in life. And for us, all three of us, pivot, change, transitioning, it is the hardest things in life to ever do. But as you can see, even when you have all the money in the world, you have all the things in the world, it's still tough. God throws things at you, but this man right here is next level when it comes to, to mental toughness and persevering. And he's clearly had a, a very successful career. And, you know, we just thank you for, for coming on the show. Crockett's Corner. Go. We'll see you guys next week.